Hey everyone, it's Sarah Threadster Nurse RN.com, and today we're going to continue our pharmacology series by comparing heparin versus warfarin. And when you get done watching this YouTube video, don't forget to access the two free quizzes that will test you on these medications. So let's get started. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the similarities between heparin versus warfarin, and then we're going to talk about the differences between these two drugs. Because for exams, you need to know how these drugs work to affect the coagulation process, what labs you need to monitor whenever a patient is on these drugs, those nursing responsibilities, antidotes, and those teaching points for the patient. So let's talk about heparin. This drug is part of the family of the indirect thrombin inhibitors. So it indirectly inhibits thrombin, which is going to alter our clotting process. So how it does this is it enhances the activity of a naturally occurring substance in our body called antithrombin-3. So once heparin hits the system, it's really going to make antithrombin-3 work in a unique way because it's going to cause it to inhibit thrombin. And whenever this happens, it's going to stop the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. So we've altered our clotting process. Now heparin works on the intrinsic pathway of coagulation, which means this pathway is activated whenever there's internal trauma to the vascular system. Now on the flip side, warfarin, which is also called Coumadin, is part of the family of the vitamin K antagonist. Now let's talk about vitamin K for a moment. This substance is used in the liver to make clotting factors. So if we throw on an antagonist of vitamin K, the word antagonist means it works against. So this medication is going to inhibit clotting factors from actually using the substance vitamin K. And how warfarin works is it works on the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. So this system is activated when there's external trauma. So some similarities to these two drugs is that they're both anticoagulants. So what they do is they slow down the clotting process, but in different ways. And one important thing to remember is that these drugs do not break up or lysis an existing clot. That's not what they do. They just help slow down the coagulation process and they help prevent slash treat blood clots. Now let's switch back and talk about the differences between heparin and warfarin. First thing is the onset. How fast does heparin start working in the body? Its onset is considered fast compared to warfarin. Its onset is slow. It takes about three to five days for a patient to actually become therapeutic enough where this medication is working to prevent and treat blood clots, which is why talking about the similarities, these two medications will be used together for a period of time. A lot of times patient will be on this continuous heparin drip and the patient will be taking warfarin. And why is that? Because it takes a while for warfarin to start working in the system and this patient needs to be switched to this long-term anticoagulation. So once that patient becomes therapeutic with their INR level, the heparin will be discontinued, will be stopped, which is, which leads me to heparin's duration, how long it stays in the system, only within hours compared to warfarin. It stays in the system for days. Now, as a nurse, you wanna know how these two medications are administered. Heparin can be administered two different ways, through an injection, this, through the sub-Q tissue, and some things I wanna highlight for you to remember is how to administer that sub-Q injection. You wanna remember it goes in the fatty tissue, of course, and you want to stay at least two inches away from the belly button and one inch away from scars because it can affect how this medication is absorbed. You also want to rotate injection sites and you never want to massage or rub the injection site after you administer the heparin sub-Q. 
Heparin can also be administered IV intravenously and many times through a continuous IV infusion. And if your patient's on this, they'll be on like a heparin drip protocol, which will have very specific guidelines on how you titrate that drip. You'll be increasing the drip. You may even have to give a bolus or you may have to turn the drip off, decrease the rate, and it all depends on a lab value, which is the APTT, the activated partial thromboplastin time. And this medication is weight-based, so you always wanna make sure that you have a current and accurate weight on your patient before you start them on heparin because you'll be giving the dose based on their weight and you wanna make sure you give them a proper dose of heparin. So let's talk about this APTT. Anytime you see that, think of heparin because that is the thing we monitor for heparin. A normal APTT is 30 to 40 seconds. That's in someone who's not on this anticoagulant. Now, where do we want them? So they're therapeutic. So this drug is preventing a blood clot. We want them one, one and a half to two and a half times this normal range. So approximately that would be about 60 to 80 seconds. That's where we want them. So if you get some test questions that are thrown out, let's say the patient's um, APTT is less than 60. What does that mean? Well, it means that this patient is not therapeutic on the strip. So the drip needs to be increased. They possibly need a bolus. How about if their APTT was greater than 80 seconds? Well, that means that they are over therapeutic. They're at risk for bleeding. We're really prolonging how long it takes them to clot. So according to protocol, a lot of times you'll turn off that drip for an hour and decrease the rate. Now on the flip side, how is warfarin administered? Only one way, through a pill, orally. And some things you wanna remember about that is that you will administer this at the same time every day and tell your patient to take this at the same exact time every day. And um, some things you wanna go over with the patient is how about if they miss a dose of their warfarin? Well, here's what they need to do. If they miss a dose, but they remember that very same day, go ahead and take the dose. However, if they remember the next day, they're gonna skip that previous day's dose and just take the scheduled dose that is due that day and to write it down what day they miss and let the physician know. Now with warfarin, we monitor the PT INR level. That is really what we care about, especially that INR level. So remember that. And the INR level is calculated from the PT level. A normal INR for someone who's not on warfarin would be 0.75 to 1.25. And where we want them for being therapeutic on this warfarin, we want their INR to be between two to three. Now, test questions. If their INR is less than two, what do you think needs to happen? They're not therapeutic, so their dose of Coumadin would need to be increased. If their INR was way higher than three, what would need to happen? Their dose of warfarin slash Coumadin would need to be decreased and they're at risk for bleeding. Some more differences would be the antidote. For heparin, the antidote is protamine sulfate. This would reverse the effects of heparin if they became like too toxic. And for warfarin, the antidote is vitamin K, which is easy to remember because we know that warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist. It really works against that vitamin K. So if we give them vitamin K, that will reverse the effects of the warfarin. Now with heparin, it's usually used short term. With warfarin, it's used long term. And heparin can be used during pregnancy, whereas warfarin cannot be used during pregnancy. Heparin, some side effects that you really want to watch out for is something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. In thrombocytopenia, we're dealing with platelets. So what happens with this condition is that the patient has developed these antibodies against heparin and how it's attached with 
platelet factor four. So whenever that happens, that antibody will go and attach to that complex between this heparin and this platelet factor four, and this will activate the platelets. Now what that does is it drops our platelet count and we can have the development of new clots or worsening of clots that are already there. So you want to be looking at that platelet account and seeing if they have signs and symptoms associated with new clots developing. And the sign and symptom depends on where that clot is. Like if it's a deep vein thrombosis, you may feel a red hardened area on the skin. If it's in the lungs, a new pulmonary embolism, they can have difficulty breathing, chest pain. If it's gone to the brain, effect of circulation there, they can have mental status changes. So it really varies, but be on the lookout for that. Another thing, if a patient happens to be on heparin for long term, or in those really high doses, they're at risk for osteoporosis because heparin affects the osteoclast and the osteoblast activity. So watch out for that, those bone fractures. Now with warfarin, it, we need to remember some things about diet. You want to tell the patient to have a normal diet, but they want to avoid excessive intake of foods that are like green leafy vegetables because these foods are high in vitamin K. And if they consume a lot of those, and we're talking about vegetables that are like broccoli, spinach, kale, things that have those green leafy vegetables because it can decrease the INR level which would make them not therapeutic. And another thing you wanna educate your patient because alcoholic beverages interfere with warfarin, they want to avoid drinking any of those types of products. Now, some more similarities that I want to wrap this lecture up on would be some more teaching points because they're both anticoagulants, some of the teaching points overlap. So they, patients who are on these, they wouldn't want to take NSAIDs, aspirin, or any over-the-counter herbal medications without talking to their physician because it can affect the bleeding times. Also, no contact sports while taking these medications because they're at risk for bleeding and if they get injured, it can be catastrophic. No, whenever they shave, they need to use electric razors, not straight razors because of the risk for bleeding, using soft bristle toothbrushes because the gums can get nicked and they're prolonging their clotting so it can affect that. And you wanna teach the patient those signs and symptoms of excessive bleeding because the bleeding happens usually in unusual places. So tell your patients to be looking at their gums. You see this oozing of blood. Looking at their urine, what color does your urine look like? It, need, it needs to be the yellowish color. It shouldn't be pinkish reddish. That could be hematuria. They're bleeding through their kidneys or looking at stool, does it look dark and tarry? That could indicate blood. If they're vomiting, what does that look like? Does it look like coffee grounds? That can indicate bleeding as well. So teach them those signs and symptoms. And avoiding intramuscular injections because of the risk of bleeding. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture over heparin versus warfarin. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.